big cancer cancer institute and national institute of health and these will actually set the tone for the further slides so as per dr richard klosner who's the former director national cancer institute he said that we have cured mice of cancer for decades and it simply didn't work in humans and i think we all as scientists will agree to this statement Another statement by Dr. Elias, who's former director, U.S. National Institute of Health. As per him, we have moved away from studying human disease in humans. We all drank the Kool-Aid on that one, me included. The problem is that animal testing hasn't worked and it's time we stop dancing around the problem. We need to refocus and adapt new methodologies for use in humans to understand disease biology in humans. So I think the tone is well said that we are testing the drugs for humans into mice, which again, there is no such a poor correlation. Can we want to believe that this is the discovery process where all the rodents and non rodents are used will have an exact translation into the clinical trials? Having said that, we do understand that animal testing has a due place in all of this process, but yes, there could be something extra. There is something definitely essential that can be incorporated much earlier in the drug discovery discovery process. So let's try to understand that what is that essential thing that can be added. Now, animal testing, we all want to know what is the necessity and what is the reliability. So as per the literature and as per the information, animal testing is primarily being done at three major levels, either for biomedical research, for product safety testing, or for education. Now we know that discovery of new lead molecules for novel therapeutic targets is a multi-step process. It involves drug designing, synthesis, screening for efficacy and safety and we know that animal testing is a definite integral part of this process but we also understand that these animal studies are very time consuming expensive and they do indeed lead to suffering of the organism each year more than 100 million animals it could be mice rats frogs dogs cats and the list goes on are killed in the laboratories Researchers have found that medical treatments developed in animals, they rarely translate to humans and have also warned patients and physicians that they should remain cautious about this fact and of the fact that extrapolating the finding of prominent animal research to the cure of human disease should be taken care of with real caution. Diseases that are artificially induced in animals in a laboratory are never identical to those that occur naturally in human beings. So let's just touch base on some hard facts about animal testing. We'll be surprised to know that more than 80 HIV AIDS vaccines, which were successful in non-human primates, they failed in human trials. And we're talking about primates over here. More than 4,000 studies report efficacy of more than 700 treatments of stroke in animal models, yet 150 of these treatments tested did not show any clinical benefit in humans. The drugs intended to reduce inflammation in critically ill patients previously tested in mice failed in nearly 150 human clinical trials. And the list goes on and on. Coming to the business part of it, we know that more than 90% of basic scientific discoveries, most of which are from experiments on animals, they fail to lead to human treatments. Then what is the solution indeed? 89% of preclinical studies, most of which involve animals, they could not be reproduced. NIH themselves admit that 95% of all drugs that are shown to be safe and effective in tests on animals, they fail in human trials because they don't work or are really dangerous. Experiments on animals, they divert time and funding from better methods. Again, as scientists, we understand that there are huge problems associated with animal experimentations. We do see high false negative rates, high false positive rates. There's a lack of validation, low productivity, high cost, frequent waving, high dose to low dose extrapolation issues, metabolism different from man, and biology, which is really the crux, is indeed very different from man. So these slides I wanted to use to set the tone that we all talk of of animal testing, we all talk of activity in clinical trials.
but then the problem is because of the biology because of the metabolism which is so much different from animal to man so we feel that the solution to these problems at least in part lies in alternatives to animal testing which are non animal based models these non animal models are reliable economical faster there is no species difference so many human cell lines are available for different therapeutic indications which can be used there is a wide application they are validated in the laboratories there is wide range of testing and on top of it all it also enjoys regulatory acceptance coming to the various fields wherein we feel that in vitro models can have huge role to play definitely we talk of drug discovery which is indeed the main area wherein in vitro models can play a very very important role and they have been playing very important roles we have a lot of disease models which can be simulated using the in vitro systems which we have available in our laboratory lot of toxicity studies can be done using in vitro models so drug testing personalized therapy regenerative medicine basic life sciences tissue engineering and also food nutraceuticals and also now cosmeceuticals can also be easily added to this list so there is a huge scope there is a huge acceptance the moment we say that we have a validated model which is alternate to animal testing we really have so many doors which get open for us so what do we speak of drf protocols so the drf protocols involving in vitro models indeed can be used for efficacy assessment for safety assessment and for permeability assessment so at dabur research foundation we have developed a wide repertoire of validated in vitro models to assess the efficacy of test agents in multiple therapeutic areas along with permeability and safety tests employing validated protocols also recommended by regulatory bodies these efficient and reliable alternate screens allow us to successfully comply with the principles of 3 hours and now we can easily say 4 hours so when we were saying that there is wide scope of testing a question may arise that is it only the herbals that we are able to test is it only the peptides that we are able to test so having so much experience in in vitro models we can say with confidence that we do have the ability to test wide scope of test items and in case a test item is still not listed here the teams can actually work on various extraction procedures to solubilize the test item or to use the test item for a particular in vitro model so in terms of the various test items it could be nces herbal extracts phytoactives nutraceuticals cosmeceuticals proteins biopharmaceuticals nanoparticles liposomes microspheres vaccines stem cells condition medium lipids hormones agrochemicals pesticide and the list goes on i'm very sure my colleagues in cell biology are definitely correlating their experience with the list over here and i really feel that we can add to this list depending on the test item that is provided to us now uh, touch basing on the efficacy and let's just quickly look at various therapeutic areas where the cell biology team has been able to develop in vitro models for so oncology definitely tops the list we were a part of dabur pharma dabur pharma has been a big player in oncology and we all in cell biology we know how to handle the molecules for cancer so apart from oncology we also have various other areas like immunity pain and inflammation allergy and hypersensitivity metabolic disorders neurobiology gastrointestinal disorders cardio protection hepatic protection liver disorders arthritis women health reproductive health respiratory disorders hair growth skin health dermal pathologies ocular disorders cardio protection cellular aging and stress energy stamina pathogen testing again the list can just keep going on and on depending on the therapeutic area so one may ask suppose a therapeutic area is still not listed here will we say no no my dear friends we will not say no to that so we will custom make the in vitro panel for efficacy test of that particular product in that particular therapeutic area so we have the technical know how we have the expertise to first really have a deep dive into the area what therapeutic area involves which cell types what is the mechanism we are looking at what is the signaling pathway we are looking at what would be the most relevant cell line to be used for that particular pathway what is the positive control that needs to be used what is the reference control which is already fda approved or in the market so i'm just going to sum up all
all these things in just one statement that in case the area is still not listed for which we don't have a validated screen as of now, risk is sure the team will work efficiently to work on the in vitro model for that particular therapeutic area also. Now, a uh, little bit more about oncology. So in oncology, Oncology, oh, I think this thing, yeah. So in oncology, we can offer anti-cancer screening in a huge panel of cancer cell lines. We have the solid tumors, we have the uh, hematologic cancer cell lines available with us, which actually cover a lot of organs, starting from brain, breast, pancreas, prostate, to the hematological malignancies like AML, ALL, CML, CLL, and again, the list goes on and on. Now, what we have actually developed over the year is that because the, these in vitro tests, they form much an earlier component of drug discovery process. So what we offer to the client is that even before you're doing the proper acute or repeat safety studies in animals, we have an array of normal cells which are available in the laboratory and much earlier in the discovery process only, we are able to determine the selectivity of that particular drug or that particular NCE from say tumor to the normal ratio. So these selectivity index assays, they actually allow us to choose at times the NCEs which have a higher safety profile. So I would say equivalent efficacy profile and a higher safety profile. And then we can proceed ahead to the various mechanistic assays. And again, when we say mechanism, mechanism may have just, it's, it just looks like a small word, but again, it has so many branches which are actually protruding out of it. So we do apoptosis, that's programmed cell death. We have a panel of apoptotic assays which are available with us. Another aspect which is very important in oncology is synergy with approved SOC. So we do realize that when we are dealing with an anti-cancer molecule, we will not be able to test it as a monotherapy in clinical trial. The clinician we just not want the patients to give away the SOCs, what they are being already recommended to. So what we do is we have the APIs available of various SOCs, depending on the cancer we are talking about. So we will just need to choose the cancer, look at FDA approved drugs, just see the NCI, just get hold of the FDA approved drugs, get those APIs and test those APIs in conjunction with your test item. And we will be able to tell whether the combination is going to be additive, antigen, diagnostic or synergistic. So this we feel has a huge role to play. Ultimately, once we are sure that we will be requiring to going into the clinical trials. Again, coming to mechanism, that is my next bullet. We have various platforms available for the detailed mechanistic screens. So these platforms, they employ ELISA, PCR, and Luminix. We also deal with various targets. These targets could be simple targets like tubulin, or it could be multiple kinases for which we have the ability to screen, or it could be some channel openers or channel inhibitors. And again, the list is really huge. Now, as oncologists, we also know that angiogenesis plays a very important role in tumor progression and its proliferation. If a particular product is able to cut out the blood supply that the tumor enjoys for just attracting all the macromolecules and the food towards it, then it's definitely a win-win situation. So we have human endothelial cells and we are able to evaluate anti-angiogenic activities of the products. We also are able to do various cellular uptake and intracellular trafficking studies. So when I say intracellular trafficking, we are referring to various techniques like electron microscopy, confocal microscopy, which indeed allow us to just see that where the drug is getting targeted. Uh, I'm sure that everybody must be thinking about the nanoparticle product that is nanoxyl over here. So we know that we have been very instrumental in delineating the entire MOA of nanoxyl. So um, nanoxyl is the nanoparticle formulation of paclitaxel. We know that paclitaxel acts on tubulin. So using various techniques such as electron microscopy, HPLC, LCMS, we were actually able to really delineate the complete mechanism of its uptake and then its release and then its action on the tubulin, which I have captured in just subsequent slides. 
we look at multiple endpoints. We just don't do a monoparametric analysis. We do a multi-parametric analysis, which really allows us to see that what is the effect of the product on different branches of cancer. It could be inflammation, it could be immunity, it could be apoptosis, it could be JAK signaling. So multiple endpoints really allow us using say various platforms like PCR or Luminex or various other technologies to actually pinpoint that what are the putative pathways or what exactly is the putative pathway by wherein the molecule is acting. And again, we have experience with wide range of test titans. Not only NCEs, we have also uh, worked with various entrapped molecules like microsphere, liposomes, and nanoparticles. Now, this is the case study, uh, just uh, the coming slide, nanoxyl. So uh, this diagram has been the result of at least 10 to 15 different studies that were undertaken just to delineate the complete mechanism that how once nanoxyl has been administered by intravenous route into a human, so what exactly happens? So let's just see the steps which are involved. And again, all these steps involved, which I'll be just speaking, are a result of various experiments, in vitro experiments. So uh, once nanoxyl gets administered by intravenous route, which we have you know, uh, shown by a beautiful blue star over here, we believe that various tumor targeting experiments led us to believe that through a mechanism called as EPR, that is enhanced permeability and retention, the nanoparticles indeed get sequestered around the tumor, or I would say they get sequestered through the blood supply. They just sequestered around the tumor. So that means we know that there is going to be a higher cellular uptake associated once we have the nanoparticle made from, say, the cremophore base formulation. Now, when this nanoparticle is just in very close proximity to the tumor cell, let's see what actually happens through various electron microscopy techniques, that is using TEM techniques, we were able to see that once we treated the tumor cells in vitro with clinically relevant doses of paclitaxel, the equivalent concentration of nanoxyl, we could actually see the formation of various endosomes. And we know as biologists, that the pH of endosomes is around five. Going further at a later time point, we were also able to see that these endosomes were indeed fusing with the lysosomes. And we know that once this endolysosomal fusion occurs, the pH can further drop to four. And again, as biologists, we know that in lysosomes, we have so many hydrolytic enzymes, which indeed can just attack the nanoparticle and release the free paclitaxel. Once we have free paclitaxel, release into the cell, the tubulin, which is a very important protein in every cell, it ultimately leads to the stabilization of tubulin. And through various apoptotic assays, we were actually able to see the modulation of various apoptotic markers. These were early apoptotic markers, mid apoptotic markers, and finally, the late apoptotic markers. The case study nanoxyl has been very well captured in this poster, very glad to share with everyone that the experiments conducted led to the formation of this beautiful poster that was presented at American Society of Clinical Oncology in 2008. So I know the pictures are very small, but you can actually still get a feel of the experiments that were done. So these small balls in the center are indeed the SCM or the scanning electron microscopy studies, which were done, which led us to believe that these nanoparticles are around 100 nanometer in size, then drop down, we have the TEM images and the tubulin western blots and the various apoptotic images for which, you know, various in vitro experiments were done and it was just, the data was just zipped and we actually came up with the mechanism that was shown in the previous slide. Now, very quickly, I'll be also talking about the immunity screens that we have. So we determine level of immunostimulatory cytokines. We determine NK cells activity, phagocytotic ability, CD markers, lymphocyte proliferation, and we work with both dendritic cells and splenocytes. Coming to inflammation, now again, inflammation is a small word, but it has huge branches which are protruding out. It could be a journal inflammation. So when we say a product has a generic anti-inflammatory activity, we know we just have to take out the immune cells and then just treat the immune cells with the product 
product and then look at that in response to LPS, how much down regulation of cytokines is happening. So when we say journal inflammation, it could be a very journal inflammation that we are able to evaluate using the immune cell. Or on the other hand, it could be a very organ specific inflammation that we are able to evaluate using a very relevant cell type. So if I'm doing the study with say human lung cell line, I use a particular inducer, I get an upregulation of the cytokines and using silymarin as a positive control, I test my various products and they are also able to downregulate the cytokines. I will say that I have some hits, I have some leads which will play a very important role or which can be postulated to play a very important role in say lung inflammation. Similarly, just using the relevant cell type, using the relevant inducer and using the re relevant cytokines. So when I say using the relevant cytokines, what I mean to say is by evaluating the levels of relevant cytokines, we are able to make some claims about the products, the potential for it to bring down inflammation in a particular organ. In view of this, we have worked on lung inflammation, liver inflammation. We are actively working in the area of arthritis, that is both OA and RA. We are doing a lot of studies in dermal inflammation, neuroinflammation, gum inflammation, IVD, and we can indeed work on any other organ-specific inflammation. For example, prostatitis has been one of the area for us. We're in using the relevant prostate cell line and inducing it for various inflammations, we were able to test the ability of various products to bring down that inflammation. And again, the endpoints can be multiple, by using the techniques such as ELISA, PCR, and Luminix. And these studies, immunity and inflammation, they have been used for various products and some of the products are also available in the market commercially. And some of the data has been used by the respective companies for the claim substantiation. Uh, very strongly, they have used our data. And we also have some publications to our credit. So publications come into play only if the client is willing to give us the due name and, you know, because as a CRO, the data just does not belong to us. But many a time since we have been the ones who have generated the data, the clients have asked us to write publications for them. And over there, we have definitely our names in some of the publications. And we know we are talking about products like Double Chaman Prash, for which even the advertisement um, also spoke of the data that was generated in cell biology department. Coming to the next area, which is a very big area for us, and in cosmetics, it has a huge, huge role to play, that is skin health and dermapathology. Now, we know that since 2013, when European Directive came into place, the animal testing has been completely banned in many countries, including India, so Norway, Israel, Europe. We are just not allowed to touch the animals for any cosmetics. Now, as biologists, we know that there is a difference between between cosmetic and cosmeceutical. So if we go by the very definition of cosmetic as per FDA, cosmetic is something which is just you know, applied to enhance the physical nature of anything. So when we are saying that we're applying a talcum powder or when we are saying we're applying lipstick just to enhance the color or just to, uh, you know, just enhance any physical aspect, that is something that comes in the zone of cosmetics. But again, when we talk about cosmeceuticals, definitely Definitely both the components, whether it's the cosmetic component or the drug component comes into play because we are always, you know, making claims about the product. Now, I'll take a very small example of a Pond's Age Miracle, uh, the anti-aging cream, even in the advertisement, they are saying that application of the product will make you look younger. And if you would just notice in a very small font size uh, in white color, they will say based on proliferation data using dermal fibroblasts. That's exactly what we do in the laboratory for skin health. So that means that we are able to use in vitro models. Many companies across the globe have been using these data sets generated from in vitro models for clean substantiation purposes. And we see it all around. It could be acne or it could be 
something uh, which has a role to play in say aging so having that uh, background with us let's just see that what all do we have to offer in skin health and dermal pathologies in various zones of the uh, parameters so the first is skin health promotion the next is anti aging we also work with melanocytes and we are able to look at skin whitening and depigmentation we also look at anti vitiligo sun protection acne psoriasis wound healing anti inflammatories and when i say anti inflammatories i'm very specifically referring to dermal inflammations antioxidant is again another area which is you know there in every therapeutic disease or any other therapeutic area and apart from these activity parameters we are also able to look at skin barrier and permeability assessments so just to uh, bring to the table we have four cell types which are normally used for all these therapeutic indications and these four cell types are human dermal fibroblast cells human keratinocytes we work with melanocytes and we also have sebocytes with us so using these four cells so you know the skin that we see the skin on our hands and everywhere around what we see is actually a combination of these four cell types now coming very specifically to sebocytes so in some parts of the face where we say that the oiliness has increased we want that the sebum production should go down whereas in the say in the cracked heels we want that sebum production should go up so depending on the therapeutic area depending on the area we choose the relevant cell line and we look at a particular biomarker now uh, having this background i like to just uh, touch base on one of the project that we undertook Uh, for an israeli company so um, we worked uh, sorry there is some issue with the sync slides yeah right okay so uh, we have worked with an israeli company called sirbel and we have evaluated their tcm extra for various therapeutic indications but one therapeutic indication that really needs attention and mention over here is psoriasis and i'm openly able to present this data because the data is available in public domain so the coded product is sirb001 and what we know that you know in psoriasis it's a particular disorder in which there is a hyper proliferation of keratinocytes there's an increased blood supply because of which you know a lot of redness happens around these psoriatic plaques so what we want is that these hyper proliferating psoriatic keratinocytes they at times you know they just don't go by the signaling and they're just uh, deviating all the rules of cell cycle so what we want is that they should enter into cell cycle arrest they should be moved towards apoptosis so that this shedding really stops so a particular cell we have actually uh, demonstrated on the first uh, picture we know that as biologists we were able to look at various signaling markers which are up regulated in psoriasis so we know that various kinases like map kinases akts and various other protein kinases they are activated in a psoriatic keratinocyte so what we did was we evaluated the activity of this tcm mixture that is serb001 on these kinases and actually found that this serb001 was indeed leading to inhibition of these kinases on the other side we were also able to look at when we treated these keratinocytes with serb001 there was an enhancement of apoptosis that means a reduction of survival and again the various associated arms were also looked at and in nutshell various in vitro models were used to come to this putative mechanism of action for serb001 uh, another area which is very important for us is hair growth we know that we have really uh i think very uh, classic models for hair growth promotion both in vitro and in vivo but i think it's in vitro which is of little bit more relevance today we can speak about in vivo models sometime later so we know that hair is also an organ and inside the bulb there are various dermal papilla cells which need to be pushed towards proliferation to produce this hair pigmented uh, uh, hair uh, filament that we you know see as hair growth so we know that as uh, biologists there are three cell types which are involved in hair growth these are dermal papilla cells keratinocytes and fibroblasts so we quickly got hold of dermal papilla cells so once we knew that cosmetics 
testing we just cannot use animals even though hair oils for hair growth promotion does not fit into the category of say pure pure cosmetics but still as per the bis we are just not allowed to use animals even for any hair growth promoting oil so we started getting a lot of requests including uh, from our parent company dabur india and we knew exactly that this is the time we really need to get hold of dermal papilla cells validate the models for hair growth and start offering them to various clients i'm glad to share with you that we were able to partner with a laboratory get these dermal papilla cells from korea dr alka quickly validated the models and we have been offering this screen to various clients including some of the well known uh, names of uh, of the various products which are there in the market including imami and uh, now coming to the x vivo one may say that how x vivo falls under the principles of 3 hours so uh, just to give a quick background when we do a typical hair growth promotion study in animals we at least need say for four groups say at least 40 animals if somehow i am able to just reduce the number of animals again i will comply to the principles of 3 hours and that's exactly what we did so using one mice dr jyoti and her team is able to isolate at least 50 follicles so just imagine what we were able to achieve with say 40 50 animals directly we may be able to achieve it say one mice and just 50 the follicles isolated from it and that's exactly what we did so we developed secondary screening assays what we refer to as ex vivo assays and very easily one will be able to appreciate the increase in the diameter of the hair bulb on day 11 when we treated this with minoxidil sulfate um coming to the next slide you know once the pandemic news was out in january february in march we were sitting at home but cell biology team and myself we were really working in synergy with other team members as well and we actually wanted to get our hands even into the covid testing we know that we are not a bsl3 laboratory but what we thought was that let's use this time and read everything about sars cov2 there were some learnings that people were drawing from say mers virus or the cov1 virus and there were a lot of uh, literature coming up free articles were floating on the internet so we actually got hold of those articles we really dig a deep dive into the mechanism of sars cov2 entry and how does it infect the host cells and very glad to share with you that now in these couple of months we have been able to partner with various laboratories who have the ability to handle sars cov2 because they are bsl3 and there are certain assays which we have been able to develop in house and these assays are follows so cytopathic virucidal test because this involves direct virus we are having to partner with a laboratory in us effect of viral entry into pseudo virus again we are doing at a partner laboratory but at least we have been able to reach to a point wherein on behalf of the clients we have been able to work with these partner labs and generate the data for them spike ac2 interaction assay is something we thought we will outsource but the data was just not up to the mark so very glad to share with you that this assay is now fully standardized and fully validated in cell biology and we are already testing a lot of products for this now as biologists we also got to know that this cov2 virus is attacking the ac2 proteins which are present on the host cells and if at all we are able to look at down regulation of these ac2 levels there could be a situation that we are able to at least minimize the risk or minimize the severity so we are also looking at effect on ac2 levels what we did was very initially was that we were able to get cov2 derived spike protein in the laboratory i know it was not as easy as i'm saying we got hold of various vendors they were vendors in china europe all across alka will have you know tales about it to tell i know the teams uh, will be there with her too uh, in this dilemma that which spike to use so what they did was they got the spike from various vendors and they actually saw that some of the spike proteins just did not induce any inflammation but luckily to our credit since we had the backup 
spikes from other vendors, we were able to get consistent inflammation in multiple organ types. Now, we must appreciate the fact that AC2 levels are not just only present in immune cells or the lung cells. Yes, they're the primary ones where, you know, once the virus attacks, it's the immunity and the lung inflammation which comes into play. But we know that it's no surprise that AC2 levels are present in multiple organ types, including lung and even heart and our blood vessels too. So what we have been doing for a client is that we have been able to validate the spike-induced inflammation in multiple organ types and using various positive controls like dexamethasone, which is definitely one of the choice of drugs used clinically, we have been able to validate the assay and also test various products to bring down the spike-induced inflammation. I know cytokine release, Tom, will not sound uh, something you know different to anybody now. We have been reading it in newspapers and articles every day. So this spike-induced inflammation if at all we are able to bring this down, there is definitely a chance that we will be able to tackle the cytokine release storm that happens in humans in, at later points in the viral infections. And again, we also wanted to look at various targets. So we are looking at various proteases and kinases which are involved in COVID infection. Now, uh, this was about efficacy uh, and quickly coming to permeability. I won't take much time here. So we have access to various human skin mimicking membranes what we call as strata membranes. Anika Gaurav are expert in this. And using trans diffusion cell system, they are able to evaluate permeability of various products. So I know that when I say various products, one will need to know that what is the active inside the product. They have already done these studies for various formulations. And I think this um, model has a huge role to play, especially when we are dealing with permeability assessment of cosmetics. Uh, coming to safety, which is uh, going to be my last uh, point in terms of in vitro assays. So we have various in vitro GLP safety studies, which we also offer to our clients. These become very, very important for cosmetics, but even for non-cosmetic areas, uh, wherein we need to look at genotoxicity. Again, we have in vitro models to offer. So the complete list has these six models that we have to offer. The first one being in vitro dermal irritation or corrosion. We offer ocular irritation by head cam assay, hematotoxicity and in genotoxicity, we have AMEs and CA test. And we are also doing cytotoxicity in BAL 3T3, which is also an in vitro alternate. So with this, I like to conclude my talk. And we know that our uh, DRF is a preclinical CRO with high standards. We have huge accreditations to our credit. We are an ALAC, OECD, ISO, FSSAI, CRO, and CPC, SEA approved facility. And I really like to um, thank each and every team member who has contributed to this uh, slide day because the confidence with which I speak today is because of the hard work put in by each and every scientist in this domain. Having said that, I know that in vivo models also play a very, very important role, but just to you know, be in the purview of in vitro test, I wanted to touch base more on the in vitro models, but yes, there are certain not certain, indeed many uh, disadvantages of in vitro models as well, you know, but that's a separate topic altogether. And if uh, anybody has any questions, I'll really welcome those. Thanks so much. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Ritu, for sharing that with us. Um, so I just, I, I know you, you've covered this already, but just a question that are the in vitro models actually sufficient for testing cosmetic or is there a requirement for us to be able to still explore a dual process? So that was something that I wanted to just get your thoughts on. Right. So, um, yeah, that's a very valid question, Shilpa, because we know that uh, since 2013, we in India or uh, in many other countries, we are just not allowed to have the uh, animal testing done for cosmetics. But again, in cosmetics, we need to be very careful that what kind of product are we talking about? Many a times it happens is that, you know, as per FDA, the statement is that 
talcum powders or lipsticks uh, only these are the ones which fall under the zone of cosmetics so if yes if you're talking about safety of these products i really believe that in vitro models are really sufficient but the moment we talk about cosmeceuticals then again you know we really need to use our judgment very very carefully but again having said that there has to be a huge array of in vitro models so over there i would believe that a battery of in vitro tests should be used but again depending on the regulatory authority we are talking about there could be a need of animal testing or else even the in vitro models that we have or we can uh, you know if we can get hold of say uh, some human derived cell types so the primary human cells which people are talking about very loudly these days they also have a huge role to play in cosmetic testing just to give you a small example the ex vivo model for hair growth that i sh had shown in my slide that is using a murine follicle right now some people believe that that is again not an animal free testing so what do we do so what people are doing is they are collaborating with various um, institutes where say uh, you know um, the surgeries are done and the human tissues can be obtained say people are going for facial uplifting and the skin tissue which is not required at all that can be brought into the laboratory after due ethical clearances and that can be really a very good starting material uh, for various uh, tests so it depends on the product we need to use our judgment whether it's cosmetic or cosmeceutical and mm -hmm. again the regulatory intent they all have a huge role to play so the answer will really depend i would say uh, project to project wise the judgment will need to be taken and and what kind of regulatory acceptance is there for for in vitro models i mean is there a large amount of acceptance regulatory wise and how can the in vitro models actually be used to guide animal studies in case there are so i guess i have a two pronged question there yeah right absolutely yes so uh, to answer your question in vitro models they have a huge regulatory acceptance and especially you know when we talk about cosmetics we know that people proudly claim that their products were never tested on animals so uh, you know people are willing to directly go from in vitro to human and they just want to skip the uh, animal studies but again uh, when I, when we are talking about other areas when we are talking about oncology or when we are talking about diabetes we know that uh, in vitro models you know the limitation is that we are dealing with a particular cell type and when we are talking about a disease there are many cell types which have a huge uh, role to play uh, see in psoriasis you know we when we say we have an in vitro model using keratinocyte it is just the keratinocyte that i'm going to play okay i may have a co culture of say keratinocytes and fibroblasts and say one or two cell types but again uh, i am not able to address the bioavailability i'm not able to un, uh, able to address the permeability and in in vitro models a presumption is that the product once it has reached the targeted cell type what will it do to a particular cell type again you know we need to be really uh, keep the cautions high uh, depending on the products depending on the therapeutic area so if somebody says that yes in oncology i will not do animal studies that just uh, you know cannot happen because in oncology depending upon the cancer mostly we are dealing with oral anti uh, cancer products or we are dealing with intravenous anti cancer products so we really need to see through various pharmacokinetic studies that what is the bioavailability pattern if there is no bioavailability it just doesn't make for a good product at all if you are talking about an oral product and we may have to directly you know administer the product say by um, intra uh, venous or subcut or uh, i am root and then again once the product is in the blood there are so many proteins present in the blood there are so many serum particles there are enzymes and the drug really has to um, bear the harshness of those hydrolytic enzymes ultimately before it reaches the tumor site so yes animal testing because otherwise kamraj will really kick me out if i say that in oncology we can't have the animal test you know they have a due place but yes so everything has a due place in science and uh, again we need to use our cautions very high so in cosmetics 
if somebody tells me that I want to use uh, an animal model using nude mice because it doesn't have hair to look at beautiful wrinkles and my product is cosmetic, then we just can't say yes to that study. But yes, if something is falling under the zone of, say, an RX cream, which a particular uh, client wants to make, uh, say, for a very specific UVB-induced damage, which is not at all a cosmetic route, yes, we may say yes to it. Or else if you're talking about, uh, you know, threatening diseases, uh, oncology, we just cannot go away with the animal test. Having said that, if, if we are just away from cosmetic into the disease uh, zone, it could be inflammation, it could be diabetes, oncology. Uh, in vitro studies can only, say, help you with shortlisting of the molecules. So suppose a chemist or a phytochemist comes to us with 10 molecules and 10 hits. I may say. So and he or she has no idea so as to, you know, what could be the activity. So you, it, it's, you know, really uh, prudent that we must understand we can't subject all the 10 molecules uh, into the animals and have a, a thousand animal study uh, to do uh, that screening, you know, uh, that just uh, doesn't comply to the principles of three hours or four hours. And if we have access to this uh, validated in vitro models using a relevant cell type, at least which helps us in shortlisting, say from 10, even if I'm able to arrive at three, that again, you know, is a huge, huge step. And from that three, I may have two leads or then a, say a single lead, which can finally go into the animals. So it will really be a big step in shortlisting. It will be a very big step in screening. And it's also a very big step in uh, understanding the mechanism. So uh, one of the beauty of in vitro models is that using these uh, cell lysates or the culture medium, which you know, uh, in which the cells float, we are able to do various parametric analysis. We are able to look at gene level, we are able to look at protein level, and you know, we can actually give a pharmacologist and in vivo pharmacologist a lead as to which mechanism we feel our product must be acting through. It could be acting through, say, downregulation of TNF alpha or through downregulation of IL-6. So the pharmacologist knows, yes, uh, in my animal studies, these markers I should definitely include. So there are a lot of guiding uh, benefits of these in vitro models. Superb. Thank you very much. Anybody else have a question they'd like to be able to ask, please? Yeah. Any questions? If no more, then uh, first thing, uh, Ritu, thanks for making a very nice presentation. And I know this is the sum total of so many years of work and so many people's work. So That's in vitro fine. models don't succeed unless there's an entire team of in vitro biologists, in vivo biologists, analytical people, everybody working together. So I think this is this is very nice. You've actually taken us all through a very nice uh, uh, session. I just wanted to, while I was listening to you, I was just thinking of one more thing. When you were speaking about the strengths and the shortcomings, both of mm -hmm. cell biology, and you gave us a very balanced opinion <laughs> on that. There's just one thought that came to me. A whole lot of people who are critical of in vitro assays have have some truth in what they say. They say they are not predictive. They just help you. They are not exactly predictive of the response that you would see in human beings. Now, we as an organization are the ones who work on the full spectrum. We work, we work on in vitro, we work on in vivo, we work on clinical support in clinical. So I was just thinking the number of projects that we've done in the last so many years, the types of molecules, where we've taken the molecules right through from in vitro, in vivo, and finally like towards clinical. So I think if we look at that data uh, together, we can contribute a lot to the translational aspects or the yes, translational yes. power of the, in vitro, of the markers that you see in vitro. Now, just to give an example, we do a whole lot of experiments. We do a whole lot of targets uh, in an in vitro setup. Most mm -hmm. of the time they go to in vivo pharmacology and they do it in their studies with specific markers. I was thinking that we should make that effort to actually check almost all the key markers that you check in an in vitro model in an in vivo setup, let's say in the xenograph. Even mm -hmm. if the client has asked us for a shorter number of targets, if there's something very critical there, we should do it for the purpose of this translational how much is your marker in vitro translating in an in vivo setup? That, mm -hmm. you know, because this is the whole issue with in vitro models 
they are very powerful very useful but everybody gets back to the same question how well yes. are they predictive of the final outcome right so i think we should start thinking about this uh, a little bit more in our uh, long projects that can be take out that data the translatability measure it and then use it to other clients to support the value of doing these tests i just thought of that and wanted you to uh, sort of think about it sure ma'am absolutely and ma'am while you were uh, telling us this i got reminded of the seedbulls uh, journey that we took and we in fact started with in vitro then the experiments were done in vivo and we were so glad to see that the markers that the cell biology team and the pharmacology team had predicted to be getting down regulated some of them were indeed getting down regulated even clinically yes. so a uh, one clinical trial was being planned we requested the client if they can just provide us some microliter of the serum because we knew that we can just access at least uh, 40 to 50 markers uh, using the multiplex platforms Absolutely. and so we were really thrilled to see that there was a pattern uh, that was getting translated let's let's start picking up one or two three of these case studies that you know which where it's worked very well let's put them together uh, not under okay. the uh, alternates to animal testing that is a separate role but as translational work because this is something that we would we have a very clear vision that we are already doing it we should formalize it so yes. uh, let's put these case studies together and start thinking about it that how well is our data translating seedbell example is a very good example and then we can add more there are so many we can think of in unicam you are going to get so much more data so yes. so this was really nice you i think um, uh, if uh, so we'll close the session unless somebody has anything else to ask you Shilpa I think we are set all right perfect thank you very much dr ritu for taking out the time and uh, for uh, doing this i know that you have a lot on your plate and you got this done for us so thank you very much for sharing this knowledge the recording of this uh, webinar of course will be available on our youtube channel and now for the rest of the series of the webinars continuing we will see everybody in the new year in 2021 hopefully not as socially distant and we'll be able to have a little bit more of an in person session as well at time um but we continue the series now after the new year so um in case i whoever is logged in from outside the organization we wish you a new year, happy new year and a good uh, and a healthy new year and for the rest of you we will see you online for our webinars again in 2021 all right thank you very much for your time and attention everyone thank you thank you very much thank you, you. bye bye guys yeah. bye, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.